a bit quiet, isn't it? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> That's a little bit better. Um, for those that don't know me, uh, my name is Mark. I head up the praise and worship team at Lifeline. Have been doing so for a few years now. I'm sure when I started, I did have hair, and there wasn't so much grey in my beard either. Um, I've had an interesting weekend. Uh, yesterday, I was uh, doing, teaching the worship session at the Doulos, and we had a really great afternoon of just tapping into God and what he says about worship. I think I've always been a worshipper. I've always loved music. And the fact that God created this wonderful thing called music has always maybe have a sense of awe, actually. It's amazing how music can affect our emotions. It has a really strong, powerful thing about it. I always joke, I don't watch horror movies, but I've seen some clips of stuff, and if you put, I don't know, some fun tune behind it, all the fear is removed, isn't it? Yeah? All that horrible sounds that they make to sort of get your emotions going. And therefore, music is just a small part of worship. It's not all of worship. And I know some people think that worship is just what we do with the band and singing and stuff. It's so much more, and more, more than that. It's a complete lifestyle. I showed a clip a few weeks ago before we um, started praise. And I'm going to show that again today because some people have asked for it again. And I'll make sure that Wilco posts it up for us. But it just gives us a little bit of time to think and process what we think about worship. It provokes my thoughts. Sometimes those things get in the way. We get caught up in life and forget that the focus is about him, about what he does. I have the PowerPoint up. Definition, the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. One of the things I did yesterday with the, the doulies it's got them to put in one sentence what worship meant to them. So if you've got pens and paper hopefully here this morning with yourselves to take notes, just for a minute, write down in one sentence what worship means to you. If you haven't got anything, just think about it. What does worship mean for you? Okay, so all of us probably... Does somebody have something that the other person had which is exactly the same as they put? Exactly the same, almost word for word. Anybody? Richard? Yeah, I said uh, basically just giving myself to God. And that's a, that's about motivation and the thing. Okay, giving yourself to God without reservation. Okay, so we're going to hold some of these thoughts now. I always like having images, because images, I, I tend to remember stuff. So why have I got an orange segment up there? Well, when I was very, very young, when I was very, very young, my dad used to be a referee, football referee, at the weekends. And I used to love going along and standing on the sidelines. It used to be freezing cold most of the time, as he ran up and down the pitch, and I was stationary. But my job was at half-time... Some of you might remember this if you played football, was to run on with a tray full of orange segments. That's what happened at half time. And I always remember that. I think my dad was a lot fitter at that those days as well. But up and down he went, and at half time it was like that. And I always used to hope there was enough left for me to have a section of orange, because that was worth standing up in the freezing cold for an hour and a half. Is Mr. Paisley in the room? <laughs> Paisley Jr.'s in the room. What, what, what's that? It's a Derby County Ram. And because of where I lived, I was dragged along to watch Derby County play. But you know what? It was something that I did with my dad. My dad was fairly busy most of the time. He was a business guy, doing all different sorts of stuff. But not every single week, but wherever possible, he used to say... We're going to go to the football. And I used to love that time. I used to love the interactions. We used to drive down the motorway with the scarves hanging out and blowing in the wind. I'm sure you get told for doing that nowadays, but that's what we used to do. And it used to be a great day out, and it was my time with my dad. That's ended up with me sort of 
having a certain interest in an amazing, superb football club, <laughs> far superior to West Ham and Coventry City and Derby County. That's the stadium that Tottenham are in the process of building. So there'll be plenty of space for all you lot to attend after 2018. These are people at uh, some sort of concert. What do you notice about the people? What are they doing? Do they look bored? Are they engaging? Do they have their hands lifted up? Are they making a joyful noise? What about that one? What's just happened? A goal. And therefore, what happens at that point? Everybody goes absolutely mentally wild just for a couple of minutes. Usually because this guy's just put one past Arsenal. But <laughs> that's the end of the digs for this morning. <laughs> but why do I say this? I think God designed us as human beings to be what? Worshippers. And I believe worship will find its way out in every single human being. And if it's not directed to God, it gets directed to something else. It's something we can't help. It's something we can't shake. I think it's in part of his wonderful creation of human beings. I didn't have to, I suppose, T said to me a few weeks ago, if you spent as much time in putting God stuff into Elliot rather than football stuff, Anybody heard that before? <laughs> and I was like, well, I didn't really input that much into him. But he saw what I liked. He got alongside. He wanted to go to the, the football matches with me. He's more passionate about Tottenham Hotspur than, than I am. He knows the stats. He knows the figures. He knows the players. He knows where the players are transferred from. He knows everything about it. Why? Because at that young age when his brain is like a sponge and it just absorbs stuff. He loves Tottenham Hotspur. You ask him any questions you want about them, he'll tell you the answer, because he's done his research. He's got interested in it. Ed Sheeran. I went with my wonderful wife to see Ed Sheeran. 70,000 people. They were caught up in the emotion. The hands were raised. They were singing and they were dancing. What is that? Worship. He was superb, I have to admit. But caught up in that, I think I said this before, it's just that moment where God just drops something into you saying, yeah, where are these people directing their worship right now? And it was to one guy standing on a stage with a guitar strumming some tunes. But everybody knew the words. Why? Because they listened to it and they'd filled their space with it. People wearing t-shirts and banners. And it was younger kids to OAPs. They were all there, all mixed together, all going to see the same thing. This is my last trip to the football. Bill, Stanford, are you in or you've gone out? He's there. John and I managed to take Bill to watch... Tottenham play and it was Bill's first game and I managed to get them front row seats and me and John were sitting, sitting behind and at the beginning of the game the fanfare sounds and out walked the players and I was not interested in that because I've seen it plenty of times before but I was looking at Bill's face and it was a right picture and if I had a video camera I would have videoed it because <laughs> it was that the anticipation was visible. His eyes were almost popping out of his head, and it was just like, no, 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 no. As he saw people that he'd only ever seen on TV before walk out onto that pitch. And the entire 36,500 fans were standing, welcoming these people out onto the football pitch. There was a massive sense of expectation. People getting caught up in the emotion of the game. 
Bill Pullen didn't know any of the songs. Some of them he will never ever sing again and he shouldn't sing them again because they're fairly inappropriate. <laughs> but within that, there was something there. He listened a couple of times, picked up the song and could sing and felt part of it and felt caught up in what was going on. Hands were raised. Do you think the referee stopped the game and said, look, everybody needs to raise their hands right now? <laughs> no. There's an automatic, Whoa, what's going on? There was a celebration when the goal went in. It was a little bit depressing, that game, because coming to about 89 minutes, we weren't winning. And I was thinking, oh, dear. Oh, dear. And all those emotions of, oh, dear. And then what happened, Bill? We scored. And what happened then? The place erupted. Absolutely erupted. I've been at games where even took hands along one time, and even he was dancing. <laughs> he was dancing. Just like, So my prompt is, what do we example to our children? In this meeting place here, this is our corporate time. I'm going to say corporate time of worship. I was saying to the doolies yesterday, I see sort of corporate time of worship, I, I compare it to a really good stew, massive big stew pot. And I think God's flavoured us all differently. It was interesting, one of the guys yesterday sort of said, yeah, the music that we have at, at Lifeline is just not my vibe. I'll let you guess who that was. Not my vibe. I said, well, what, what, what is your vibe? Because it's about him. It's about laying down sometimes our preferences and our desires and the stuff that we like to say, I'm going to enter in. I'm going to enter in. And I think God has flavoured us all individually. And when we come together, if we give up ourselves and put ourselves into that pot, there's an amazing stew that is created. So I'm not asking you to become clones and all do things the same way. But what's God put on your heart? When you're in your, your quiet time with him, when you're in your praise time with him, when you're in the car with, the, with the, some tracks on and you're singing at the top of your voice and you really don't care what's going on around you. It's bringing that in. Bringing that into this arena and saying, I'm going to give of myself. I'm going to place myself in the pot. I'm going to be added to that wonderful aroma. That aroma which goes up to the throne room of God himself. Richard. I just wanted to share something um, I saw happening at the back of the meeting a couple of weeks ago. Um, we were singing that song, Our God is a Great Big God, and there was a visitor here. And she had a, about two or three-year-old child, and she was trying to keep him occupied with his, with his toy cars, and was quite was frustrated with it. Well, not frustrated, but distracted by him. And, and suddenly, you, look, you saw him look around, and he just paused, and he looked, and he looked at the person behind him, and saw what they were doing. And so he started moving his hands and joining in. And then he just suddenly caught something and he grabbed hold of his mum's hand and his mum picked him up and suddenly he was engaged with the worship. And I just think there's just a sense of, of something that God is doing amongst us. Um, there was another child not far away and we had that pause um, when Phil chosen a song that Mark couldn't find or something. But the band was still playing. And this child was also about three years old and she's still standing on the stair, on her chair, standing on her chair and just clapping in time and just worshipping. And I think there's just something that God is doing that, that we just need to spot and we need to capture um, amongst our children. That child actually got distracted by an adult. Um, and it's just, just an awareness of what God is doing. Thanks, Richard. So that sense of what part have we got to play in here? I'm always conscious of the children over here. Whenever I'm leading praise myself, I'll tend to go and interact with them, get them involved. 
One thing I learned very early on in worship leading, I don't want to leave anybody behind. Yeah? I want to gather them all up. I want to say, come. Come on a journey. Worship is about going from here to there, to wherever God's got for us. And we saw a few weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, when we had pretty much an extended time of worship and praise. We went on a journey together. And it's that encouragement of one another. It's all well and good for me to run to the mountaintop and say, this fantastic up here, and then take a look back and find that everybody's about three and a half miles down the hill. So what does that require us to do? It requires us to be sensitive to what's going on. It requires us sometimes, your sacrifice might be as a parent, to, for a time, disengage yourself from what's going on here and stoop down to your children and say, come on, this song is talking about this. This song is talking about that. And helping them, lifting them up sometimes, explaining some of the words. As I mentioned before, when we went away on the, um, was it the Invaders, Debbie? One of the things I did, I took a couple of the songs and I broke them down line by line and explained what it was about. I got them to talk about what they thought about the song and stuff. Which meant the next time we used it, they could relate to it. Oh, I know this one. This is talking about this. This is talking about that. And it enables them to engage with it. CDs are available, Spotify, all sorts of stuff now. You can get most of the worship tracks that we do are available. Rather than leaving your radio stuck on radio one, two, three, or four, depending upon how old you are, play a few worship tracks. Play some of the new songs that we're doing because it just sticks in their heads. And sometimes they can't read the words up here, no. But if they hear it enough times, they pick it up and they can learn some of these songs. Why? And it equips them to therefore be able to engage when they come into this corporate time. They feel like it's not just for the grown-ups. Not just for the grown-ups. When the children of Israel heard that mighty ram's horn, they knew it was time to come to the hill of the Lord. I'm sure they didn't say, okay, kids, you can stay here. Mum and dad are off. We'll be back shortly. See ya. I'm sure the children would have been explained, look, when we hear that sound, when we hear the call to worship, this is what we do. This is where we go. We're going together. It's exciting. Come be part of this. Children, look at what we do. The reason Elliot fell into Tottenham Hotspur because he saw me and my quiet, composed, sitting down quietly watching the football. Just ask T. She knows when the football's on without even being in the room usually. He watched it. He learnt it. And therefore replicates it. Let's train and equip our children. Let's train and equip our children. It's what we are. It's what we are as a people. Let's train them. Let's help them. Let's help them engage so that they can be part of it. And it's not about playing kiddie songs or kids' worship songs. Yes, some of the other stuff is very wordy and difficult, but at the same time, if we start to explain what it's about, even if they can't sing, they'll feel ways of expressing themselves, be it dancing, be it clapping, be it moving, or whatever. So my next question is, what do you worship? Family? Possessions? Technology? Football? Pop stars? Fashion? I'm sure that list could be considerably longer. But I think anything that directs all of ourselves away from looking at God and keeping our eyes focused on his, him can become worship. I'm not saying we shouldn't have hobbies and interests and stuff like that. But how much time do we spend focusing on that? How much do we put their emphasis on that rather than directing stuff back to him? Some of you might be able to think of a few more. Those are just ones that came to mind. I've asked a couple of the worship team just to come and give a couple of minutes each about what they think about worship. Chris? So, 
what's left. <laughs> um, when I was on Doulos, part of our Doulos training was we went to Africa for about six weeks. And um, it was a bit of an eye-opener. Not been to Africa before, not seen anything like that. Um, but one of the things that really st stuck in my head was all of the companies or small businesses in Africa have really great little taglines. It's like you can't open a business without having a really great tagline. And it's normally like whatever they provide. So it might be like gardening equipment. It would be like for all your garden equipment requirements. <laughs> that would be the little tagline and they just have it on there. Um, and one day I had a really sore throat. So I went into a pharmacy and I bought this packet of uh, cough lozenges. And their, their strap line was, for the tiggle you can't scratch. <laughs> <laughs> just brilliant uh, and it stuck with me I, we, it was kind of a running joke throughout the weeks um, man, he's, who could find the most ridiculous strap line and this was, this was the winner um, but it was it's something that stuck with me and I, when Mark asked me to talk I was just reminded about that and I think we are, we are designed to worship that's what we are, you know, we're built for I remember um, some of my earliest memories of um, engaging with music in general would just be in the playground in my junior school. I remember just running around the playground, just singing tunes to myself that I've made up. Um, and it's just something that has always been part of who I am. Um, just singing just little nursery rhymes or just lying to myself in the playground, dancing, skipping around them. Um, and... So, yeah, I just designed to be a worshipper. And, and for me, it tickles the, the scratch that I've... It <laughs> scratches the tickle that I can't scratch any other way. Um, and I heard, uh, just in the news this week, uh, it, was, it was someone on there that was talking about um, the music industry in general and the state it's in. They're currently, music sales, sales of music, are the lowest they've ever been, ever, for music. I mean, even sheet music was more popular than <laughs> people buying albums now. And yet, the interesting thing is that uh, ticket sales for live events have never been higher. Never been higher. And that's because there's the tickle there that people can't get itched any other way. So they'll pay money to go and watch a, a pop group to try and do it. And, and I'm so thankful that I found God and that I haven't got to try and find that for myself, find it another way. I was quite into heavy rock at one point and, you know, would go and see bands and, and stuff, but God saved me from that and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful for it. Um, for me, worship is the thing that we do that is, it's, it's all about God and it's all for God. So every single thing, uh, yeah, everything kind of has something else attached to it in life. There's a purpose, there's a reason, there's someone we're doing it for. But worship is when our focus is just purely on God, and it's supernatural. There's, there's no way we can do it apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and it's just an extravagant, lavish expression of love at the feet of Jesus. It's when we just pour out that alabaster jar at his feet and just sacrifice everything and say, everything that I've been given, everything that I have, I'm just going to give it to you. And it doesn't make sense. It doesn't look normal in the eyes of the world, but it is that complete devotion and that complete passion. Um, for me, I learned, I mean, the music is obviously a huge part of it. That's something God's given us to help us. But for me, I learned more about worship when I put down my guitar, forgot about singing and just sat and looked at Jesus. Um, it kind of sounds strange, but when I just completely dropped everything else and just said, God, I'm just going to sit in your presence. And that was, um, that's when I truly learned what it was to worship God. The music is how we get into that place, but actual worship is that place of having everything that is within us abandoned to him and just pouring it out at his feet. And it's not, like I said, it's not just about the singing. It's about an entire lifestyle of just having our eyes fixed on him. And that's something that David talks about a lot. He talks about 
having um, the Lord set before him, having his eyes fixed on the Lord and um, acknowledging him in all his ways. And that is worship. It's whatever we're doing, whether we're at work, whether we're at school, whether we're looking after our kids, whatever it may be, it's doing that with our eyes fixed on Jesus and saying, this is for you. This is all for you. Every single part of my life is for you. Um, And the, the music, when we sing songs, that's just the overflow of that. But that day in, day out, this is for you, constantly turning our eyes back to Jesus without anything but him. That, for me, is what I've learned worship to be. Yeah. It's when you realize you use the wrong font. Worship is, is costly. I'll, I'll get the scriptures and stuff sent out to you. One of the things I remember when Davey, Davey Cock came a few years ago and did his whole week's training and equipping on worship. One of the things that stood out for me most of all was that whole thing of, it has a cost, it's costly. Breaking that jar over Jesus' feet had a huge cost. Not only in the monetary terms, but in the, her dignity. She didn't care. And she dried his feet with her hair. She gave everything she had. Ben Skinner sat up here two, three weeks ago when we had that amazing time. And I bring it back to that point where he made a choice of putting his electronic device to one side and saying, this is more important than you, God. I don't want it to be. I'm going to put that to one side. And God broke in. God broke into the entire meeting. So I felt for God to bring us back to that place again of saying, is there anything that we have put above him that causes our eyes to be diverted? Matt Stanford sent me a few pictures, which I'm going to use this morning, but I think they need to be unpacked a little bit more, and I'm probably going to put on a Sunday night live in a few weeks' time or after Christmas to go and spend some time in these things. So I'm going to give you a brief overview today, but I'm going to work with Matt to set it up. I would encourage you all to come to that, just to spend some time with him. What's that? Someone bowing down. Somebody giving everything. Open-handed. I got us all to kneel a few weeks ago in worship. Yeah? Not very often that we kneel nowadays. Not very often that we bow. But I felt sometimes it's just that standing here is not enough. I want to kneel before the king. I want to kneel before him. I want to bow before him. I want to give everything I've got. I don't want to be holding on to anything. And I think that's why that picture is so powerful because it's that sense of completely bowed down but the hands being completely open. It's putting aside everything. And it's the awesomeness of God's presence. God's presence is phenomenal. Is God with us in this room right now? Yes. But there's certain times where you just, it manifests itself. He inhabits the praises of his people. And we get amazing times. And it's interesting, isn't it? As we focus on him, I think it's just in his nature to just pull it back out again. So we don't come here, we don't praise with the intention of getting something. But I think that's just the heart of God. We don't have to worship from afar. I watched a recent dramatisation again of that temple curtain being torn. Thick. Thick fabric. (laughs) What an amazing moment in history. Where it went from people worshipping from afar to actually entering in. That invitation's there to come and enter in. To be caught up in his presence. 
touching heaven. That place where John was caught up in Revelation and got a glimpse of what it was to glance into that throne room, to see the worshippers and what was going on, to be part of it. And we have that privilege. We have that invitation that when we come in, we're caught up with the angels. That sense of just being in his presence. Just you and him. Sitting in the quietness. Spending some time. And she said, no music, no guitar, no nothing. Just to focus ourselves and give ourselves to him again. And to remind ourselves. Because life gets busy, doesn't it? I know for me it does. I feel like it's just busy, 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 busy. No time to think. But just having that time, taking some time out to get ourselves refocused on what he does. Allowing him to change us, allowing him to transform us. I love this picture. Raincoats. What do raincoats do? Stop us getting wet. So my question to you this, e- uh, this afternoon is, are you preventing God from going to those places which you've covered in a rain mac, where you've put your barriers up, where you've said, this far but no further, thank you very much, we're at the end of the comfort zone. What prevents us from getting wet prevents us from entering in. How about taking off the raincoat today? How about totally immersing yourself in him? How about not having excuses? Not saying this is not my vibe, I can't enter in here. Let's remove all of ourselves. Just got a clip I want to play. Put that second clip up. This is King David. King. Think about it. The king. There he was. Standing there. So there you've got the king of a nation removing his crown removing his robes and leading the procession am I telling them to take off all their clothes now and dance in that underwear no (laughs) no (laughs) but what stuff what stuff do you carry what stuff are you holding precious what stuff do you, do you need to derobe from to enable you to fully come in, fully enjoy, fully look at him, fully enjoy him, fully immerse yourself in his presence? I think this is my favorite of the images because that's how close he is. That's how close he is. Just to whisper it into your ear. He delights in you. He created you for worship. And he delights in you. He delights in you. Tenderness and mercy. It's not about formulas. Worship is not a formula. You can't play the same songs in the same way. Just expect the same thing to happen. Because God's different. And he brings different thoughts to different individuals. But it's about overflow. It's about giving of ourselves. And so as we enter into worship... Are you going to give of yourself? Or are you going to have your rainbow firmly zipped up?
to protect yourself from that wonderful deluge. Is there anything that God's prompted you about this morning where you think, oh, I've let that get in the way. I've been too overprotective about that. And it's diverted my gaze. Because I want us to come back to that place of our gaze being upon him. And then it ceases being about the music and the band and the loudness and the sounds. And it becomes about him.